quite plausible story, is that one of the appeals of getting China into the WTO was to require domestic change to bring laws into conformity with the WTO with the knowledge that surface conformity without any degree of implementation or without relatively decent implementation was going to raise problems within this robustly legal international arrangement. Uh, Wen Jiabao, of course, uh, and the concern with the uh, Sanlong and other problems of the peasantry, there's a significant legal uh, component built into that as well, property rights uh, and uh, local government accountability. Um, as all of this uh, you know, suggests, again, we're talking about a fairly instrumental um, a vision of law, one that tolerates outside of these contexts where major goals seem to be imperiled or where crisis seems to strike, uh, it tolerates a lot of legal weakness. Uh, and you know, this is one way, I think, of making sense of this pattern of moments of significant concern in areas of, of, of serious effort uh, coexisting with a great tolerance for uh, weakness in the legal system. So foreign investors and domestic enterprises routinely complain about the weakness of the legal environment in which they have to operate. Lots of complaints about state functionaries who don't know or don't care about the legal rules that are supposed to govern them. Uh, many, many reports on courts and the problems of local protectionism, corruption, incompetence, uh, forced compromises and settlements rather than full litigation, something which has actually ticked up again recently in the, with the new uh, leadership of the legal system. Uh, and uh, lots of typo no one, lots of complaints about uh, unlawful economic behavior uh, linked to insiders, uh, things like insider deals for privatization of firms, uh, land seizures in urban and rural areas, and so on. All of these uh, behaviors are very likely and certainly are understood at elite levels as suboptimal in terms of national goals of uh, efficient development, but they may be locally rational. They may be a stable equilibrium. They may make work very well for the economic interests of the locality, and it's just given the long history of decentralization and the costs both of recentralizing and of establishing legal mechanisms for making central rules stick, it may be that this is a tolerable arrangement, again, except when uh, a change uh, seems to be necessary to sustain momentum the WTO-related reforms, or uh, to avoid uh, the wheels coming off, things like at least the imagined worst-case scenarios coming out of SARS uh, product safety and things of that ilk. This pattern may also, this sort of uh, uh, pragmatic uh, thin law pattern, also may fit with, may help explain some of the seeming ambivalence toward corruption. We get recurrent campaigns, but they don't ultimately do all that much, and you get high-profile cases. Uh, there are a few of them listed there, where certain high-profile individuals uh, do get prosecuted for corruption, but you don't get great uh, systemic change. Uh, again, you know, some outer policing uh, of, of the problem of legality. All right. Um, something which I probably don't have much time to go into, but, but one of the other issues with understanding the role of law in the China development model is comparing China to other countries in East Asia. And the East Asian model, of course, has gotten you know, much play over the years. Um, and if you look at it, it's actually borderline incoherent in terms of its discussion of the role of law, right? It's all about state-led market conforming, if not fully market governed economic development. And it's about authoritarian politics, at least until you reach a certain stage of development. But how can you figure out a coherent legal story that throws together Singapore, Hong Kong, Taiwan under martial law, Korea under uh, dictatorship? There are certain similarities, of course, but it's very hard to tease out. Uh, a simple rule of law. To the extent you can, it tends to rely on notions of informal or ad hoc uh, regulation and guidance between the state and firms, or perhaps very little of that if you get to the Hong Kong case. Um, and relations among firms tend to be informal and not uh, based on um, you know, formal contracts and other legal arrangements. And certainly there are resonances of all that with the Chinese case, but again, I think You'd be hard pressed to say there's a coherent single East Asian model for law. So we've got to look around for some, um, some uh, perhaps China unique explanation, even if we're not going all the way to a thick Chinese model for rule of law. So one last piece of the story that, the, about the kind of pragmatic and innovative make it up as you go along uh, vision of the Chinese model uh, is it may also get us into a couple of other uh, otherwise perhaps puzzling features of Chinese law. Uh, and this is partly borrowed from another project that I don't know what I'm doing with yet, but I figured I'd try it out anyway. Um, one of the puzzles looking at Chinese law is that sometimes law seems to lead reality and sometimes law seems to lag reality. I don't have a good theory of why it does this, but it's an observable uh, phenomenon. Uh, why does law sometimes lead? Why is law sometimes put out there pretty much self-consciously as aspirational 
and not meant to really be implemented in any near-term or thoroughgoing way. It could be that, you know, the system's been going along like this for at least 30 years, and arguably more than that in this vein, and you just get habituated to the notion that the law on the books isn't law in practice, and everybody's learned to live with it. Uh, it could be that you're coming out of a hard ideological authoritarian plus, if you will, kind of system where people get used to a certain amount of hypocrisy between the principles that one supposedly adheres to and, and what is practiced. All systems do that, but certainly by the time you get to the late Mao, Mao years, the gap is pretty big. Uh, it might be attributable to extensive, perhaps by some lights, excessive borrowing of foreign models, a desire for state-of-the-art legality, right, the proper uh, almost Washington consensus, if you will, model of what the laws should look like, even though they don't particularly work. Or it may be a developing country problem, the so-called implementation bias in, uh, in policy of any sort, which would extend to law. That is, much of the work gets done not in the making of the rules, but in the day-to-day -day implementation, which accounts for not only aspirational laws, but fairly broad and sparse ones. Uh, it may be that partly what's going on here uh, is that uh, laws are at least allowed, and perhaps even now sometimes meant, uh, to be used for invocation outside formal legal practices. Uh, uh, so you get uh, law serving not as a rule to go out there and implement, or to have the system implement any, any reliable or, or, uh, or uh, you know, thorough way, but instead it signals policy directives uh, to officials. Uh, it, it's a way of, um, of uh, signaling to society. Uh, to go out and try to assert these kinds of rules and rights, uh, rather than through litigation or through insisting on straightforward enforcement, perhaps appealing to state actors in a discretionary way, or going through letters and visits, uh, or seeking media coverage and things of that ilk. And there's a lot of work that's been done on this. Mary has done some of this as well. Uh, there's a lot of work that's been done on this phenomenon, and it really is uh, a, quite, uh, a quite striking phenomenon. And it's received some criticism from those within China who are most enamored of a full-blown rule of law. So you look at the work of somebody like Hulei Fang, who says the problem is that Chinese are too much still invoking legal rights on bended knee to the emperor, uh, rather than asserting the rights as something that the state owes them. And then you get the rights consciousness, rules consciousness debate that's gone on in some of the Western literature on this. So there's a sense that maybe what law is doing is something very different. It's an important way of sending uh, policy commitments, but not uh, simple, straightforwardly implementing it. The other phenomenon that goes on that feeds into this is uh, there's been a long-standing practice in, in Chinese lawmaking uh, during the reform era to establish legal rights without providing remedies. And when you provide rights without remedies, you encourage this kind of behavior. So if you look at things like the state-owned enterprise law, which goes back to the middle 1980s, there are rights to resist certain exactions, extractions, and orders from departments in charge, but there was no administrative litigation law or other kind of formal remedy for it. Uh, Nico knows more about this than pretty much anyone else in this country, shareholders' derivative suits. Uh, you get obligations for directors and officers and for majority shareholders, controlling shareholders and that, before there was any meaningful uh, mechanism for enforcing it in the courts. Uh, with the property rights of, uh, situation, we've seen a series of constitutional amendments culminating in the 2004 amendment, and then it was another three years before there was a statutory implementation which created the necessary but not sufficient. Uh, basis for making those rights legally operative. Um, that's the law leads phenomenon. The flip side of this coin is law lags. And so what you see uh, is um, many areas in which formal legality catches up slowly with social practice that is formally illegal at the time that it's first undertaken. Uh, in some ways, this is the obverse of rights without remedies, people going around insisting on their rights before they have any legal means of asserting, of asserting them, but, but more commonly, it's, it's, it's a somewhat more uh, complex phenomenon than that. So there are practices that are unauthorized by and that indeed are against the laws that are in place at the time. Think all the way back to decollectivization. And one of the great iconic moments of reform uh, <laughs> is the decollectivization that starts down in Anhui, right? And if you go to the, the decennial exhibits on the history of reform, they always trot out the little document with a thumbprint. From, from the first peasants who swore their sacred honor and mutual support if they got caught and punished uh, for decollectivizing. Well, clearly, whatever you make of that uh, semi-hagiographic story, uh, there were uh, steps out ahead of what, um, what was uh, definitely authorized. A few years later, secondary markets and those contract land use rights. People started selling them, trading them around when there was no legal basis for it uh, and a good argument that it was technically illegal. 
uh, transfer of ownership in uh, state-owned enterprises or majority-owned enterprises, privatization, as it were, around the edges at least, uh, without um, a legal framework for doing so. Uh, and more recently, property rights. Uh, if you think of the famous nail house in Chongqing, right, the most famous nail house in the world, even made the front page of the New York Times. You can't get much more famous than that. Um, very colorful figures, that certainly helped. But if you, yeah, the, the, the coverage of that and the arguments made were invoking constitutional property rights that weren't yet legally operative and invoking statutory property rights that weren't retroactive to the attempted taking of the property in question. And we've seen some others that have been less successful uh, in terms of getting law to catch up, uh, but this seemed to be variations on the same thing. So think of small property rights, the Xiaotanjian. The idea that in areas that are technically rural, you can build some nice suburban housing and trust that nobody's going to take it away from you, even though there's no, uh, no underlying legal right. Controversial undertaking, but again, seems to build on these prior patterns. Uh, the clever moves in telecommunications fields by uh, foreign investors to try to set up a and correct me on this if I'm wrong, you sign a foreign joint venture, which would then be the partner to a joint venture, so you wound up getting majority foreign ownership on the cheap in a way that was eventually disallowed. But you see lots of these, these attempts to push the envelope, which I think is created by this culture of allowing law to lag. All right, so that's kind of my scattered tour through the, the pragmatic make it up as you go along version of the Chinese development model. And if you're making up to go along, I think both lagging and leading functions uh, are more understandable for law. What I want to turn to now, in the bit of time I've got left, is a thicker Chinese model. The notion that there may be a Chinese model that has some of the concreteness, some of the specificity for the role of law that you see in, say, the Washington Consensus or, or rule of law preaching, have theory will travel uh, prescriptions that we saw in the uh, first decade after the Cold War. Uh, and, as, and as a counter to that kind of uh, Western style model, if you will. Uh, and here I think you can tease out of Chinese experience perhaps and can find now in some, uh, in some descriptions within China of what sense to make of uh, China's development experience the past 30 years, a much, as I say, thicker notion of a Chinese uh, model of law and development that has law performing a few important functions in the context of reform era China. Uh, the first and most obvious of these is creating a legal framework for market-oriented and internationally open economic development, but not all the way to neoliberal openness, Washington Consensus type of norms. Uh, the idea being to promote rapid growth and to sustain authoritarian rule, uh, perhaps for its own sake, but also as a claimed foundation uh, for sustaining growth and development. Um, that's part of what goes on in what we've seen throughout the reform era uh, of putting pretty much every major economic policy and a good number of non-economic policies into legal form rather than relying on, on uh, less formal means. Uh, and you can just go through the entire list. Uh, contract law, uh, which created an expanded universe of partners and parties with whom you could enter into economic relationships and a wider uh, range and discretionary control, uh, more responsive to market signals, if you, were, if you will, among uh, economic relations. Uh, creating a set of rights of managers and of owners. Uh, of an increasingly diverse, varied set of uh, economic actors, although with retained roles for the party and state, state as owner, state as regulator, and less formal influence. Uh, laws and similar changes that rewrote the fiscal relationship between economic enterprises and the state, moving them more towards arm's length, rule governed, uh, not simple remission type undertakings within what had been the state sector, and the shrinking of the state sector relative to other, uh, other parts of the economy, but again, not all the way down the path. Uh, complex ownership structures leaving state owners fairly, uh, fairly significant if far up the chain of, of, of nested ownership with uh, many means for extraction of resources and many means for influence, including, for example, the appointment of management at key uh, enterprises and banks and things of that ilk. Um, We've seen similar changes in terms of, of laws to regulate the rights of uh, other capital providers, that is capital in the form of other than retained resources of enterprises. You can see it in, in the laws governing banks, securities, securities markets, bankruptcy law, all of these moving down a path which from baselines is clearly more market oriented, clearly more uh, accountability, autonomy for the relevant actors, but again with the state retained role of significant proportions, gatekeeping to bankruptcy, uh, control over lending through banks that remain subject to policy influences, uh, controlled, although wider than it used to be, access to listing on equities markets and so on. Uh, property rights, again, provides parallel examples, uh, so too the emergence of tort law. Again, much more robust property rights than before, but still 
uh, far short of what, say, the Washington Consensus would demand or would say is necessary for successful development. And tort law has emerged remarkably from zero baselines, uh, but um, I think it's fair to say with a fairly crabbed notion of positive rights. You've got to point to some source of an affirmatively granted right rather than the thing that at least Anglo-American common lawyers are used to, which is this notion of, of generalized rights to be free from careless wrongs, at least, by others. Similar story in the law governing foreign investors and traders. Uh, and uh, supporting all of this, of course, the growth of legal professions and legal institutions, including mechanisms of dispute resolution, which are necessary to make any of this real. Um, a second function, in addition to this market and international openness supporting uh, legal framework, is using laws to monitor and control those behaviors that threaten to undermine economic development. And there are plenty of these kicking around. Um, and so if you look at the rural economy and issues of land rights, uh, if you look all the way back to the early days, the reform, there are lots of contract suits arising out of these uh, initial household responsibility system leasing out of collective assets. And many of those are on the surface contract suits. But if you scratch the surface even a little bit, and sometimes you don't even have to do that, they are really suits about collective and cadre abuse, uh, trying to tear up and rewrite the contract in ways that benefit either local power holders or the, the pre-existing collective. Or they are complaints about self-dealing. Some insider got a sweet deal. Uh, you see this with orchards, and it proceeds up the chain to factories and companies uh, later on. Uh, you look at, in more recent times in the, in the rural sector, uh, questions of takings uh, of land, compensation, um, and all of those sorts of, of issues. Again, a similar uh, story where what we're talking about is legal rights as claims against state behavior uh, that is seen as either directly undermining uh, economic advancement by creating uncertainty or as indirectly undermining the structure that is seen as you know, suitable uh, to promoting economic growth and certainly to, to maintaining viable economies in parts of the rural sector. You even have cases of things like peasant class action suits, a couple of them are one, or collective action, class action is not quite the right word here. Uh, some peasants down in Zhejiang who sued successfully as a group against expropriation of their property. Some of the nail houses have been successful, although not that many. And now new rules that attempt to police and limit real estate speculation, a sense that there are uh, people out there, many of them officials or officially linked, uh, that are engaged in behavior that threatens uh, to bring the whole thing, at least, if not crashing down, at least making it uh, vulnerable. Um, similar story outside of, outside of uh, land uh, type rights in the commercial and industrial enterprise sector. If you look at litigation, much of this is, of course, perfectly ordinary commercial litigation among firms. Nick has done a lot of work on this. Um, but some of it is really looking at official cadre type behavior that threatens to undermine uh, the economic order and policies that the regime has worked hard to create. So you've seen local governments in the early days held liable for so-called briefcase companies, that are basically empty companies set up sometimes by entrepreneurs and such, but sometimes by local governments that were in fact held liable. Minority shareholder rights suits are often really suits against a closely state-linked majority shareholder. And so there is the usual fear of economic opportunism and abuse by a controlling shareholder, but with the special Chinese twist of majority shareholders who aren't necessarily rapacious, although they can be that too, but sometimes are pursuing goals other than profit maximization. They're pursuing stability, employment, um, getting with the latest uh, political wave, things of that ilk. Um, and what you see going in a lot of these legal areas where on the surface, although not always even there, our, uh, our standard party-to-party -party, uh, legal disputes, uh, there's a significant part of self-consciously supporting uh, the growth of markets in a market-oriented economy, uh, self-consciously implementing policies which happen to go down that path, and even courts that engage in a shocking amount of didacticism. And there's been a little literature on corporate law in the West that talks about the sort of shaming function of the Delaware uh, Chancery Court and so on, but uh, you don't have to do as much work as those people working on Delaware law had to do there in Chinese courts. It is openly didactic. It is clearly saying this is what the rule is. This is how we should all be behaving. It's using individual disputes uh, to make broader uh, policy points about what is bad behavior by state-linked actors and what is approved uh, policy agendas. Um, and this, this continues into other uh, fields as well. If you look at tort law, I, I've, it's a complicated argument that I don't have time to get into now, but basically I think it's fair to characterize China's emerging tort law as significantly regulatory in structure. It looks much more like the kind of things we would do through public law and much less like private rights and remedies. And you see much of its content uh, being responsive to those scandals, crises, and instances of government failure 
that I mentioned earlier. Uh, virtually everything that seems remotely novel about the new uh, Chinese tort law you can trace to a particular crisis like melamine and, um, and earthquakes uh, and faulty construction and so on. And environmental harms too for that matter. Um, in the foreign linked economy you've seen attempts to uh, stop uh, foreign investment and economic openness undermining behavior by officials uh, through a bunch of mechanisms, but many of them essentially limit the prior expansive discretion that uh, approvers of foreign investment projects and regulators of foreign investment and, and trade uh, enjoy. Uh, so you see, uh, again, more rule governed, uh, less um, discretion, a diffusion of the authority to engage in these kinds of economic relationships down to uh, firm level actors, uh, and uh, enhanced uh, transparency and enhanced access to remedies. There's a reason foreign related cases get brought at higher level courts. Uh, it's a sense that you get better justice there. The empirics of that are you know, perhaps a little, little questionable, but that's certainly the perception that drove it uh, and, and, and at least explains the motivation. Uh, more obvious cases lie in the realm of things like public law, clearly administrative litigation lawsuits, measures to punish cadres and other officials. Uh, these are not always successful, sometimes they're suppressed. Uh, but sometimes, and in, in at fairly high percentage rates, although what those mean we can talk about, um, uh, plaintiffs are successful. Uh, and there are at least anecdotal signs here and there that, uh, that uh, people don't like getting sued in administrative lawsuits and will sometimes change their behavior. Uh, officials will change their behavior to law-conforming ways. And then you see a whole bunch of changes in terms of what might be called laws for lawmaking. Uh, ways of uh, providing only weakly institutionalized, uh, but still existing and invited, uh, means for input from below and exposure of bad behavior, bad in the sense of not conforming uh, to central directives or bad in the sense of undermining economic development and the policies meant to pursue it. Um, finally, third function here uh, is using law in this Chinese model to preempt or co-opt pressure for political change, including democratization. Uh, here, some of the story that I've told so far fits into this, this strand as well. Law that helps to achieve or protect economic growth at the macro level and protect individual economic expectations, the ability to have the security that the deal you made will go through, and if it doesn't, you have some recourse. Uh, those are part of what one might call a social contract with Chinese political characteristics. I'll make you wealthy, I'll make sure you don't get too badly abused too much of the time, and you won't demand fundamental political change, which is kind of scary and disruptive anyway. Um, and here, law provides you know, a possible uh, means to that end. In addition, uh, law provides, through more public law type means, prospects for some, but importantly, atomized, fragmented, not mass movement, not institutionalized, uh, mechanisms of accountability, uh, accountability of uh, power holders at the local level, of cadres and such. Uh, and here we see a whole bunch of examples of, of how law does this. Administrative law is probably the most obvious package in the form of administrative uh, litigation law challenges to concrete acts taken by agencies, not challenges to underlying rules, but challenges to their implementation. Uh, more discretionary appeals for administrative reconsideration of actions or rules uh, that, uh, that injured parties don't like. Uh, and the ability, um, rarely achieved, but on the books and occasionally out there, of state compensation for wrongs committed by state actors, a tort-like remedy. You also see the ability, uh, sometimes from below, complaints raised, especially when amplified in the media, to prod prosecution or other sanctions of officials who have engaged in uh, behavior that abuses citizens' rights and that undermines the economic agenda. And there are these striking but admittedly very fragile shoots of protecting individual constitutional rights from abuse by party and state-linked actors. To name two of the most famous cases, the Chiu Ling case, which was partly a private uh, bit of behavior, but the state education authorities at the local level were among the defendants uh, too. And this is where the Supreme People's Court famously, if only briefly, uh, said that it is appropriate, and indeed pretty much required, for the local court to look directly to a constitutional right in this case, uh, the right to education, uh, where uh, the victim had had her identity stolen and her educational opportunities expropriated uh, by another uh, classmate, as it were, another uh, uh, colleague in her, in her town with the help of a whole bunch of people, including some state actors. And of course, the famous Sundragan case, the 
uh, the college graduate who had the terrible misfortune to dress like college students did in my day, which is to say looking like bums, uh, and therefore was taken into custody as a migrant, didn't have his papers with him, uh, and died in custody uh, at the hands of the abuse of, of the Custody and Repatriation Center. Uh, this, of course, led to the uh, media firestorm, as it were, uh, calling for an end on constitutional grounds uh, to the regulations under which he was detained and subsequently died. A petition to the National People's Congress Standing Committee to exercise its, shall we say, fallow uh, power of constitutional review to strike down state council regulations. Really was a remarkable event, ultimately preempted by the state council canceling its own regulations and substituting others, thereby avoiding the development of a mechanism of constitutional rights protection, just as the Qi Yuling opinion was quietly canceled along with a host of other much less important uh, Supreme Court uh, uh, documents uh, a couple of years after it was issued. Um, there are also a set of legal mechanisms that provide what you might call input rights. Uh, that is, legal mechanisms that give citizens not democratic participation in the full-blown sense, but some right uh, or some opportunity, at least, rooted in law to have a say on what the rules will look like. The law and legislation, which has its preferences for hearings and other kinds of input, circulation of draft laws and such. Uh, the emergence of administrative procedure law. The administrative procedure law itself is long stymied and tabled, but at the local level there are many parallels, and indeed some of the administrative legal academics who work in this field say, actually things are kind of okay because one of the reasons the general law is not high on the agenda is so much has been done at the local level to make some progress. Local elections, some broadening representation in party and state institutions, consultative democracy, maybe even civil society lobbying, things like that. There are a lot of mechanisms, some recognized, many of them recognized and supported in some degree. Uh, in law to achieve um, uh, uh, some kind of input. And finally, the reforms to criminal procedure, uh, sanctioning laws, and so on, which at least create some freedoms from. Um, I'm running out of time here, so let me just say a couple things about the, the um, uh, road ahead, the prospects and sustainability, possibly, of this model, whichever version you take, although implicitly it's probably more about the thicker uh, third model that I've been talking about. Um, there are broad social constituencies emerging in China that support and make demands for law. Rights consciousness by any measure has been on the rise, at least from baselines. The Wei Chen or rights protection lawyers have had an unhappy ride, but they're a remarkable development. Uh, litigation rates rose for a long time. They've now plateaued and declined some. That may or may not be a bad sign, and we can talk about that in Q&A if people are interested. It's kind of ambiguous evidence. There are lots of surveys that suggest at least compared to uh, cynical conventional wisdom, relatively high satisfaction with litigation uh, processes um, and, and their fairness. Lots of cases that get celebrated in the media and create uh, some buzz around law and so on. Um, so that's you know, constituencies for more law in the Chinese context. It may turn out that 60s social science was right after all and that the lessons of democratization and other change in East Asia are somewhat generalizable. That is, when you get a sufficiently large middle class we're all control freaks in the middle class, right? We kind of want, we, we tend to demand law and expect it. Maybe not democracy, maybe democracy, but certainly protection of legal rights. And uh, developments among economic actors and other economic factors in China uh, where you see other signs that may uh, nudge law forward. Uh, uh, there's a sense increasingly among uh, those who look at these issues relatively closely, including some fairly rigorous studies that suggest that part of the basis on which different regions in China compete now is quality of, of institutional, including legal infrastructure, especially as cost advantages have eroded on the Gold Coast and even the second tier cities. There's pressure to uh, create a somewhat better environment, uh, at least for um, economics, and it may spill over into other areas. Uh, there's a, at least an anecdotal sense backed up by some survey work that says that there's a perception that having the law on one side matters. It's necessary but not sufficient, or at least it's a bad thing to be on the wrong side of it. Uh, some work on the shift possibly from Guanxi to contract. And if you want something a little more quantitative, China does surprisingly well in the World Bank rule of law surveys. It's in the mid-40s in percentile, which is way above the lower middle income country average, which is its group. Uh, and it's way, way above where China scores on, say, voice and accountability, democracy, uh, political freedoms of various sorts. Um, you, you know, China is now deeply linked, much of China is deeply linked to international uh, economic sectors and, and, and folks abroad uh, who may exercise some, di some discipline uh, toward um, uh, law uh, regarding law implementing behavior, much as people have long said 
these external disciplines matter for places like Singapore and Hong Kong. Um, right. And then uh, other, other uh, uh, groups that may be influencing where this is headed. Uh, lawyers, judges, policy intellectuals, they're among influential interest groups in China. These are now, this is a, a sector that didn't exist all that long ago, and now these people are very prominent and they're at least partly uh, part of the policy process. And they can tap into commitments that have been made at the, at the top leadership uh, levels. A uh, sense that law in some form is necessary, but it may turn out to be a lumpy good. You can't get just the amount you want, just for the parts you like. It may be you have to accept some law more robustly uh, than you would like in terms of restraining state and party discretion. And it may be a snowballing as well as a lumpy good. That is, it starts to sort of build on itself. Uh, it may be that mass binding matters. Having shouted the virtues of legality for so long, uh, there are limits to how much hypocrisy and backsliding uh, one can undertake. Some aspects of law uh, seem to fit with the current agenda of a harmonious society. What's creating disharmony, bad behavior, often by officials that can be policed by law, or often by fusions of political and economic power that are a new phenomenon in the Chinese landscape. Uh, and there are, of course, you know, leadership attitudes and preferences and signaling. Hu Jintao said law more times in the 17th Party Congress address than has ever been done before. That doesn't guarantee anything, but it's, it's a reflection of, of at least a sense that you've got to pay some attention to this. And what is striking is the, the number of people in relatively inner policy circles that have some legal training and some legal uh, bent. Now I will close on a downer note. Um, that is, there are some caveats and some concerns here that I think have grown worse in the last couple of years. Uh, first of all, I don't want to fall back into the thing I beat up on at the beginning of my talk, uh, the suggestion that you know there's not some holy trinity of, of markets, uh, democracy, and rule of law that everybody must approach. Uh, you know, we're not all bad Hegelians. Uh, so it is possible that there are different paths to sustainable in the sense of ongoing rather than environmentally tolerable uh, development. Uh, and Chinese policy positions on these issues have hardened in recent years. There is a real statement that there may be a China model, which is fundamentally different. The 2008 economic crisis has, of course, increased uh, this, this kind of, of, of noise from China, but it, it predates that. And there are lots of concrete examples of bad news in recent years. Uh, Wang Chengjun and the Three Supremes, not Diana Ross's backup singers, uh, but rather the notion that law is only one of the three things that courts should consider in addition to policy and popular opinion. Uh, Luo Gan, who had the law portfolio before being replaced by Zhou Yongkang, who's about equally wonderful and liberal, um, warned of color revolutions in China and the possibility of excessive judicial independence and what that might mean. Uh, Charter 08, which was a constitutional document, uh, came to a bad end, and Nobel laureate status notwithstanding, uh, so, so far has Liu Xiaobo. Um, as I said earlier, Qi Ling, Sun Zhigang uh, essentially went nowhere. Um, as, as major constitutional breakthroughs. And if you look at the statements of Wen Jiabao, especially the ones that get reported home rather than the Fried Zakaria interviews, uh, Hu Jintao and other uh, prominent leaders, what they're saying about political reform and law really is in many ways putting the brakes on any notion that we're going to see rapid progress toward a Western style or full-blown, if you prefer that term, uh, rule of law. Uh, whatever the long-term uh, prospects for legality may be, transitional phases can be long and uncertain. And finally, China's changing place or changing sense of its place in the world, uh, I think, is, is, is not a, um, a positive development if one wishes to see uh, a rule of law, and at least in the, in the sort of Western sense, uh, take hold. There's a new and off-putting hubris uh, coming out of the 2008 global financial crisis and China's uh, relatively robust survival of it. The Asian financial crisis 10 years earlier uh, laid the groundwork for that. Um, and I think we may see a China model becoming less relevant to the developing world as China seems to be not only a big, powerful, near superpower, which doesn't seem to have much to say to small, weak countries, uh, and where um, uh, what one might call neocolonialism and hegemonism with Chinese characteristics is taking off. China's problematic relationships now with African uh, natural resource exporting countries and, shall we say, an increasingly, group of, an increasingly nervous group of neighbors in East Asia. And so with that, I'll stop and welcome your questions.